Good morning, everyone. Last September, I was visiting some family members in Colorado, a Lake City to be exact. It's a beautiful small town nestled in the San Juan mountain range of south, in the south central part of the state. It's a bit off the radar. It's almost exclusively a tourist destination and local tourist brochures actually boast of being one of the most remote locations in the entire country. There's only one highway in and one highway out. The year-round population is somewhere around 400. It's in a deep valley surrounded by towering peaks, many of which are among Colorado's famous 14ers. That is, they are over 14,000 feet in elevation. Even in late summer, some of the peaks still have small amounts of residual snow, now mostly ice from the previous winter. Mooses are commonly seen, or moose? Is it moose or mooses? <laughs> moose are commonly seen uh, grazing at the, uh, the local lake, um, grazing on the vegetation there. By September, when I was there, the aspen trees were beginning to turn. Um, there was just these glorious transformations of yellow and orange and red colors. And when the wind blows, if you've ever been up there, they, they kind of twinkle and it gives kind of this sparkly, sort of magical appearance that only adds to the, the display. So what I'm trying to say is it's about as an idyllic, peaceful scene as one could possibly imagine. Where could I go to escape all the polarization, the drama, and the troubles of the world? Just a place where I could go and relax and visit with my family and enjoy all the natural scenery that was there. Uh, we were staying in a relatively small campground, maybe of about 20 motor homes or so, and some camping trailers. Immediately next to us was a very large motor home, and in, from an, in front of it, prominently displayed for everyone to see, there was a really large flag and a really large banner. And I can't remember which one was which, but one said, you know, Trump 2024, and the other one, said something like, I think I'm getting this correctly, there were three lines. The first line says, Hillary Clinton belongs in prison, Joe Biden belongs in a nursing home, and of course Donald Trump belongs in the White House. So, so much for the idyllic atmosphere within the campground at least. My brother-in-law, who had already been there for a few days before I arrived, said, said they're not the most friendly people I've ever met. I was determined not to let the flag and the banner spoil my visit, and I didn't. Uh, we were so busy doing other things that we spent little time in the campground anyway. I only physically saw these people a few times during my stay, and I spoke not a word to them. I fantasized, though, <laughs> about what I might have said to them had the opportunity arisen. Perhaps I could have mentioned that, in view of the evidence, some of their statements were factually and legally incorrect. Or at least I could have had a civil conversation with them and perhaps found some common ground. Or probably not. I believe their main intention was not to have a conversation, but to create a provocation. In a kind of a different, almost comical situation, uh, I've become kind of fascinated with the recent news about the, the recently arrested Sam Bankman Free. Did you all know who oh, yeah. SB, SBF? Is anyone not familiar with him? A few. He's, um, <laughs> until recently, I'll, I'll just continue reading. <laughs> he was, until recently, a much celebrated, uber cool cryptocurrency multi billionaire. Um, he's commonly considered to be a genius, and um, strangely enough, he was the, um, usually known for being disheveled. I mean, he looks like he just woke up after a long night. Uh, his, his wardrobe, in, in spite of being a billionaire, consisted of uh, worn out t-shirts, jeans, and um, tennis shoes. That's, that's all he was ever seen in. Now, but that was part of his persona. You know, he was just too cool, too smart, uh, to bother with, you know, normal, you know, casual attire. The crazy story, though, is, is not that he was, turned out to be a crook, <laughs> but there's this 
kind of apocryphal story that he was on a Zoom call. This is before he was arrested. He was on a Zoom call, and the purpose of the Zoom call was to solicit uh, money from investors um, to you know, put it into his cryptocurrency business. The, the, the bizarre thing, and it's actually two bizarre things, the bizarre thing is that while he was on the Zoom call, literally talking to people, he was playing video games on another computer. <laughs> while that seemed strange, the stranger thing, it was not seen as any type of yellow or red flag, uh, but only evidence that he was some sort of generational genius who could multitask, you know, play video games while he convinced, you know, s supposedly invested um, sophisticated investors to give him their money. He's also quoted as saying that books are obsolete. You know, they're too long, too wordy, they take up too much space, too much paper being used. If you've got anything to say, just put it on a blog page or maybe on a flag or a banner. I titled my message this morning, Are You Talking to Me?, after a scene in the 1976 movie Taxi Driver. Now, I have to ask you, has anyone here not seen Taxi Driver? A few of you? you you've never seen Taxi Driver? I can't believe it. <laughs> okay. It's a very, very disturbing story about a taxi driver played by a young Robert De Niro who is basically a human rocket ready to go off. Uh, he's driving around New York City. He sees beautiful women. He's exposed to all kinds of hypocrisy and encounters some of the worst people you can you know, possibly imagine. So he's seeing the full breadth of humanity. He's full of energy, he's got lots of ideas, but he's frustrated and he's angry and he's got all this passion about what to do about it. So, in the course of the movie, he's either courting a drop-dead young woman, this is played by young Sybil Shepherd, or he's either going to rescue a young teenage girl, Jodie Foster, played by Jodie Foster from a prostitution ring, or he's going to assassinate a presidential candidate. He's not sure which, but he's got some options. In the famous scene, Armed to the Teeth, and I, was, I contemplated showing this, the video, but it, it's so creepy and so disturbing, I, I felt maybe it was inappropriate. But he's standing in front of a mirror, uh, rehearsing for whatever option presents itself to him. And the famous line, as he repeats, over and over again, he says, are you talking to me? And he says this repeatedly, and what he's doing is, though, is he's rehearsing. And the whole conversation he's having with himself at that point is a motivational tool for some impending conflict. He's not interested in the conversation. And if you see the movie, you know, off he goes, and I won't tell you how it ends, but it's a very disturbing movie. You have to see it. It's part, it should be part of your, it should be part of your uh, education. I recently read that the Earth's population has exceeded 8 billion people. Uh, this is probably not a terrific thing for all sorts of reasons, but it also emphasizes the necessity that we will need to have, if, the necessity that we'll, we will need to be able to effectively communicate effectively if we are to survive. My two trivial examples of prob problematic communication aren't much, but I would fear for the future if that small amounts of ill will gets multiplied by 8 billion people with access to Zoom, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, websites, 24-hour cable news, blog pages, text messages, emails, and not to mention more older forms of communication such as phone calls, snail mail, and real face-to-face -face conversations. So I have some worries about the future. The two anecdotal stories I've mentioned are just examples of what I fear is an increasing trend to use language in ways that, are, that is intentionally confrontational, flippant, 
dismissive, disrespectful, ill-considered, and disingenuous. But with the new year upon us, perhaps paying attention to these issues would be a good and relatively easy resolution that we could all pay attention to. Regardless of your theological persuasion, all of the main religious and spiritual, spiritual traditions have something to say about the language and how we communicate with each other. If you are new to univer Unitarian Universalism, one of our characteristics is that we can, we can search for wisdom from other traditions and it's actually encouraged. I found just, just a, f a few short writings I'd like to read you from the, uh, the Hebrew Bible. This is from Proverbs. Thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, but, but wisely spoken words can heal. Uh, from the Christian Bible, this is from Ephesians. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful to building others up according to their needs, that it may, be, that it may benefit those who listen. Um, this is a, a Muslim quotation. I kind of like this, and I'll talk about this in just a moment. Um, it says, silence is wisdom, though few are silent. One of the, seven, of the seven UUA principles, at least three, I think, can be directly applied to uh, speech. The first is the inherent worth and dignity of every person. I, I think we owe it to at least hear people, at least that much. Uh, the second one is justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Um, I feel we have a responsibility to at least try to understand where they're coming from, to have some compassion for their, at least their circumstances, if, if we don't believe in what they say. Uh, the third is acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth. Um, I think how we speak with people uh, not only nourishes our own spiritual well-being, but, but theirs as well. My favorite, though, is in Buddhism, of course. For those of you who are not familiar with it, I sort of pretty much identify as a Buddhist. Uh, number three on the Noble Eightfold Path is something called right speech. Um, the Noble Eightfold Path, by the way, is pretty much a laundry list of um, objectives that every person should strive to attain, to attain to escape suffering, or I think a better translation is the unsatisfactory nature of life. Right, right speech is defined as no lying, no rude speech, no tell -wish. They usually don't. When I, cite, when I set out to write this message, I dreamed I'd get it all straightened out and send you home with everything you know, that you'd be equipped for smooth dealings with everyone you encounter in 2023. And, but that's probably not gonna happen. And, <laughs> and you, we wouldn't be the first. And I, I, I couldn't find the exact uh, reference, but there's a story that maybe the, the greatest, maybe wisest talker of all time Socrates even had trouble with this. And there's, this is the reference I couldn't find, but I, I think this is correct. He was engaged in a dialogue, and if you're all familiar, you know, Socratic dialogues are these, basically conversations he would have with people to figure out the truth or whatever the nature of it was they were talking about. And he would ask questions and they'd answer him, and he'd ask more questions and they'd answer, and, and the, who knows where the dialogue would go. And these, these dialogues were you know, recorded by Plato. But there was one dialogue he was having, this was Socrates, and they came to some sort of an impasse and he asked uh, the person he was speaking with um, if he was telling the truth and if he really was interested in following the train of logic, if he really wanted to see where this was going. And the guy said, no. I, I don't care, I already, I've already decided where this needs to go and there's nothing you can say that will change my mind. And Socrates basically terminated the dialogue and he says, well, okay, I, if that's the way it is, I guess this isn't really a dialogue and we're not really having a conversation. And he, and he didn't throw punches as far as I know, but that was the end of the dialogue. 
And Socrates was basically, um, had decided that if you're going to speak with somebody who is not going to be conscientious with you, then there's really, there is no dialogue. So that's an issue for everyone. Unfortunately, I think this, this tactic of walking away is going to become increasingly unfeasible in a world with eight billion people, especially with the technology that we have now. But you might say the world could be a beautiful place if people would only listen to me. They would be forced to see the beautiful logic of my reasoning and agree with me, and we wouldn't have any differences of opinion. You know, if they would just get it, why won't they just get it? Um, I have three words. Don't do that. <laughs> um, when I started writing this sermon, I was, I was going to... When I started writing this sermon, I was, I was going to finish this up and I was going to tell you why, but I need another 20 minutes to do that. Uh, but there is an answer to that. Why don't we say, don't do that? Uh, maybe in a future sermon I will. <laughs> uh, to conclude this morning, I'd like to, again, go back to my Buddhist uh, orientation and talk about a technical detail that I wasn't even aware of about the, the Buddhist, um, the Eightfold Noble Path. Again, it's pretty much a laundry list, you know, don't do this, don't do that. It's, it's not particularly uh, theologically deep, it's, it's just pretty practical, day-to-day -day practical habits. Uh, but I always thought, well, it's called the Noble Path because these things are so noble. That's incorrect. The nobility comes to the person who attempts to follow its path. So my parting words for you this morning are go out there. It's 2023. It's a brand new year. And try to be noble. Thank you for coming this morning and have a great day.